The cost of war can be measured in many ways. Financially, materially, politically, or of course, in blood. However, there is a fifth cost that often gets overlooked in the history books, and yet is arguably even more painful for the families back home. For it leaves them with no body to bury, no grave to visit, and only unanswered questions as the rest of the world moves on. This is the cost of war for the families of those who disappear in the chaos of armed conflict. In today's episode, we're going to look back at three cases surrounding the US involvement in the war in Southeast Asia, where entire groups of Americans vanished. Here are three cases of mass disappearances of American service personnel and civilians related to the struggle for Vietnam. Welcome to Wars of the World. On March 15, 1962, a Lockheed L1049H Super Constellation airliner belonging to the Flying Tiger Line took off from the island of Guam at 1,257 hours GMT, destined for Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, a flight scheduled to take some 6 hours and 20 minutes to complete. While a civilian aircraft and crewed by non-military personnel, on board the Super Constellation were 93 jungle warfare trained US Army Rangers and three members of the South Vietnamese military, all of whom were traveling to South Vietnam's capital, Saigon, having left Travis Air Force Base, California, aboard the aircraft the day before. Beginning the next leg of the journey, the flight from Guam appeared to be running smoothly, with all radio communications between the pilots and air traffic controllers being nothing more than routine save for an unscheduled change in altitude. At 1,422 hours, the pilots contacted Guam International Flight Service Station and reported that they were 100 miles west of the island, cruising above the cloud base at 18,000 feet. They estimated their arrival to Clark Air Force Base to occur at 1,916 hours. Approximately one hour later, ground controllers experienced an unusual burst of static while speaking to another flight after which they attempted to radio Flight 739. However, they received no response, and nor would anyone else ever again. Flight 739 and all the souls on board had vanished. A massive search effort was quickly organized, and shortly after it got underway, US authorities were contacted by the crew of the supertanker SSTL Linzen, who informed them of an unusual sighting they had made whilst cruising in the vicinity of Flight 739's projected flight plan. At 1530 hours GMT, lookouts on the bridge of the tanker noticed a vapor trail in the moonlit sky north of their position and observed it fly behind a cloud, which was then engulfed in a bright flash, which they interpreted as an explosion consisting of a white nucleus surrounded by a reddish-orange periphery with radial lines of reddish-orange light. They then observed two burning objects fall into the sea, these briefly appearing on their navigation radar at a range of 17 miles from the tanker's position. The tanker's captain ordered a course change to investigate the scene, hoping to recover survivors, while the ship's radio operator tried desperately to contact the US Navy, who had nearby bases on Guam and Manila, but there was no reply. After five and a half hours of searching, they were forced to give up and resume their previous course until they finally made contact with authorities. No trace of Flight 739 was ever found, despite an exhaustive eight-day search by air and sea, covering 200,000 square miles, one of the largest ever conducted up to that point. Meanwhile, an investigation into the service history of the aircraft failed to turn up anything that could conclusively lead to a possible explanation of what might have happened. The only notable incident to have occurred in the aircraft's flight history was that during a prior flight, an engine lost power, but this was ruled out as a possible cause without any evidence to the contrary, since the engine had been repaired and operated numerous times without fault since. Even then, if the Constellation did lose an engine, it had three remaining, which could theoretically keep it airborne long enough to find an emergency runway. 
The only thing investigators could agree on was that whatever happened to the aircraft happened suddenly and without warning. This, coupled with the sighting from the crew of the SS TL Linzen, led investigators to conclude that Flight 739 had tragically exploded in mid-air for reasons unknown. That might have been the end of it, were it not for a bizarre coincidence that occurred around the globe while Flight 739 was making its way from California to Saigon. The very same day that Flight 739 departed Travis Air Force Base, a second flying Tiger Line Super Constellation took off from that same base before crashing while making an instrument approach to the Aleutian Islands. Landing short of the runway, the aircraft's main landing gear was sheared off as the fuselage hit the ground and it immediately caught fire. Six of those on board received varying injuries in the crash, but one man was left trapped in the cockpits and eventually consumed by fire. Given this coincidence, conspiracy theorists have suggested that both aircraft were victims of sabotage, although possibly only one was the intended victim, but the saboteurs initially sabotaged the wrong plane. Upon realizing their mistake, they sabotaged the correct aircraft, but were unable to rectify their work on the earlier constellation. Reports that the constellation that crashed in the Aleutians was carrying secret military cargo of some kind seems to back up this theory. However, no evidence has ever been presented to support this claim. Other theories that have sprung up is that the explosion was the result of a botched hijacking attempt, either by one of the South Vietnamese soldiers intending to defect to the north, or by one of the rangers on board, who may have had some kind of mental breakdown. But again, until any wreckage is found, the truth of what happened to the aircraft and the 107 passengers and crew on board remains an enduring mystery. Well before the conflicts began to ramp up for the American government following the Gulf of Tonkin incident, a great number of American civilian aid workers were already in Vietnam offering their services to the people of the South as the country descended into war, first against the French and then between North and South. On December 23, 1947, Reverend Archie E. Mitchell arrived in what was then still Indochina to begin work as a missionary based at Da Lat. Traveling with him was his wife, Betty, and the two of them shared a history concerning a unique but tragic incident during the Second World War. On Saturday, March 5th, 1945, Mitchell and his previous wife, Elsie, who was five months pregnant at the time, arranged for their Sunday school class to have a picnic in the mountains near their church in Bly, Oregon. While Mitchell was gathering their lunch from the car, Elsie and her class saw a strange balloon land nearby, and the excited children ran towards it. Before Mitchell could warn them not to touch it, the balloon exploded, killing his pregnant wife and five children. The balloon was a Japanese Fugo balloon bomb, thousands of which had been floated across the Pacific to attack the United States, and the Sunday school outing were the only American casualties to this attack. His new wife, Betty, was the older sister of one of those who was killed. Serving two five-year periods in Indochina and then South Vietnam, where he offered prayers and medical aid to the Vietnamese people, he briefly returned to the United States before heading back to South Vietnam in 1959 to continue his work. Mitchell, whose family had now grown to include four children, felt confident that their aid and spiritual work would keep him and his staff safe from the conflict that was brewing up between the South Vietnamese government and the Viet Cong guerrillas. Sadly, this belief would be shattered on the night of May 30th, 1962. At around 1945 hours local time, Mitchell and a few others were on their way to attend a prayer meeting when a Viet Cong team attacked the Leprosarium. It was obvious from the start what the raiders' intentions were. Mitchell was captured and tied up in front of his terrified wife and children, along with two others. Daniel Gerber, who was part of the Mennonite Central Committee, and Dr. Eleanor Vitti, a surgeon. The Viet Cong attempted to take Mitchell's family as well, but the three captives made it clear that if they attempted to do so, they would refuse to cooperate with them, and so the family were left behind when the raiders retreated at approximately 2200 hours after ransacking any medical supplies they could get their hands on. What happened to them after they were taken by the Viet Cong remains unclear, but it is known they were kept alive for many years, trading their skills in treating combat wounds for their safety. U.S. intelligence was able to pinpoint the rough location of the three captives several times over the coming years. 
But in each case, a rescue was deemed unfeasible, either due to the Viet Cong defenses or the thick jungle terrain in which they were held. There were repeated negotiations for their safe return, but by 1969, these negotiations began to collapse, and no further word was ever heard of them again, even after the US withdrawal. Almost certainly they were killed. However, just how remains a mystery, with the most likely answer being that they were shot by their captors when they were of no further use, or perhaps even during an escape attempt. It is of course also possible they were killed by American forces attacking the Viet Cong with air and artillery strikes, or they simply succumbed to one of the various illnesses that thrived in the jungle environment. On January 27, 1973, the US and North Vietnam signed the Paris Peace Accords, seemingly bringing the conflict to an end and allowing the US to finally withdraw their military forces engaged in combating the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong guerrillas. However, US forces continued conducting reconnaissance operations across Southeast Asia, monitoring communist activity to ensure they were abiding by the peace agreement. Baron 52 was the call sign of a Douglas EC-47Q electronic intelligence gathering aircraft, which took off on a reconnaissance mission on the evening of February 4th, 1973. Its eight-man crew were tasked to monitor activity along the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos, which over a decade had been the lifeblood for the communist forces fighting over the border in South Vietnam, bringing thousands of tons of equipment as well as fresh troops from the north. The mission was fairly routine for the crew of Baron 52, but it was no less dangerous, even with the signing of the Paris Peace Accords, as the North Vietnamese army heavily defended the trail with hundreds of anti-aircraft guns. These gunners were also very familiar with the shape of the EC-47Q and the distinctive sound of its engines, for it was one of a number of special variants of the World War II-era C-47 Skytrain, the most feared of which was the AC-47 gunship known as Puff the Magic Dragon. This aircraft was able to bring a great deal of punishment down onto troops moving along the trail, and so the sight of any C-47 was enough to see communist gunners scrambling into action to shoot them down as quickly as possible. Knowing the danger, Baron 52 was required to check in with a nearby Lockheed EC-121 warning star, call sign Moonbeam, every 30 minutes. Just after midnight, the crew of Baron 52 reported to Moonbeam that they were approaching their operating area over southeastern Laos. All seemed to be going well, until, at 125 hours, Moonbeam received a communication from the EC-47Q indicating that they'd taken anti-aircraft fire, but were safe and continuing the mission. However, just 15 minutes later, Baron 52 reported that its sensors were indicating they had been illuminated by a hostile radar, which was now guiding the anti-aircraft fire onto them. Baron 52 then missed its scheduled 200 hours check-in, and given the previous communications, the USAF presumed it had been shot down, and so launched a search and rescue mission. The aircraft had gone down in a territory swarming with communist forces, and as such, the efforts to locate the crash site were repeatedly thwarted by heavy enemy fire thrown against the rescue aircraft. It would not be until February 7th that the wreckage was finally discovered, and even then, it would be two more days before members of the 6994 Security Squadron, lowered by helicopter down to the site, could search for survivors. The rescuers found the aircraft's fuselage upside down, having lost its wings during the crash and largely gutted by a fire. Of the crew, they managed to find four bodies belonging to the two pilots, the third relief pilot, and the aircraft's navigator. However, there was no sign of the four intelligence specialists who operated the aircraft's intricate sensor equipment, a great deal of which was also missing, implying the aircraft had been stripped of such equipment prior to their arrival. A plan was concocted to retrieve the fuselage using a heavy lift helicopter, However, given the hostile activity in the area, this was deemed unfeasible, and so, after an hour on the scene, they withdrew, only able to retrieve partial remains of 1st Lieutenant Robert E. Bernhardt, the third pilot on the flight. The four mission specialists were all officially listed as missing. However, curiously, just two weeks later, this status was changed to them having been killed in action, 
despite there being no bodies to warrant such a change. Even more curious is that according to the official account of the rescue squadron who investigated the crash sites, the National Security Agency had come into possession of intelligence considered reliable that four airmen had been captured in the vicinity of where the wreckage was discovered, and with no other US aircraft listed as having gone down that night, these must have been the missing crew members. On May 24th, 1973, Roger Shields, assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Defense, and the one who was tasked with identifying and repatriating American prisoners from North Vietnam, wrote an internal memo concerning the missing men, explaining, quote, the Defense Intelligence Agency feels there is some reason to believe that the four may have actually been captured. This raises the question of why the change of status. That question has been asked by the men's families for almost 60 years. The most common theory is that the US Department of Defense or the Air Force didn't want to endanger the fragile peace while US forces were pulling out of the country. Nobody wanted to continue the war, and so it was better to have these men disappear than to create a situation where the American people demanded their sons back, leading to a possible resumption of combat operations. The problem with this theory is that the US airmen captured during the war were already being released as part of the peace settlement. This raises the possibility that they were murdered by their captors, who were perhaps eager to kill some more Americans while they had the chance, and this was covered up, again, to avoid damaging the fragile peace. Another theory that emerged is that these men, with their intricate knowledge of the intelligence gathering equipment recovered from the crash sites, were smuggled into the Soviet Union for interrogation by the KGB before being killed, although no evidence has ever been produced to support this. In 1992, and again in 1993, under pressure from the men's families and lobbyists in the US government, a team from the Pentagon traveled to Laos and examined the scene again this time in much greater detail than the rescuers in 1973. They recovered several bone fragments, including a tooth positively identified as being from one of the crew, and a dog tag belonging to a crew member. Following this, the matter was considered closed, with these remains officially being interned at Arlington Cemetery, along with the remains of their comrades. However, just who the bone fragments belonged to remain a contentious subject, with some even claiming that the Pentagon investigators didn't even confirm whether they were human or not. Also, the discovery of the tooth was not enough for many of the families either, since it was only confirmed one of them had lost a tooth in the crash, not that they all died at the scene, yet the Pentagon seemed satisfied to bury all eight on this one piece of evidence, while seemingly ignoring all reports of the captured airmen. Many members of the men's families continue to believe that the true fate of the airmen is covered up for some reason, a belief reinforced by the testimony of one of the rescuers, Ronald Schofield, who insists that when he investigated the scene in 1973, there was absolutely no sign of the men anywhere to be found. And there you have three tales of mass disappearances of Americans surrounding the conflict in Vietnam. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.